ready for takeoff. All right, let's get started. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of microservices, the hottest new architectural trend of the last decade, really. But what is a microservice? Well, I think we can infer from the name that they're like regular services, but smaller. And we can infer from the hype around them that they are like regular services, but better somehow. And as far as I'm aware, this is all the information about microservices anywhere on the internet, not a single blog post, book, or think piece anywhere. So we are going to have to extrapolate ourselves and I think we can conclude from those two pieces of information that smaller is better for microservices. But what is the optimal size for a microservice? Maybe each of your microservices should, should encapsulate a single concept. Or maybe if you're breaking apart a monolith, each of your models should be a microservice. Or maybe a single cross-cutting concern. Now, I'd like to put this to a vote, but I'm not going to because you'd all be wrong. <laughs> Let's take a look at the data. If regular service-oriented architecture is good and microservices are better, well, any fool can draw a line between two points, and I am such a fool. So I assert that the optimal size for a microservice in Ruby is the single object. If you've got an object anywhere in Ruby, it should run on a remote machine. But let me be more concrete. Say so you've got a class, and we've got an instance of that class, and I call a method on that instance. This method should run on a remote machine. This object should be a proxy object, no matter what it is. Folks, you may not like it, but this is what peak architecture looks like. <laughs> I don't know how this is better than a regular service, but it must be because microservices. And of course, our custom objects should be microservices, but this is Ruby. Everything's an object, and therefore everything should be a microservice. This array should be a microservice, this string should be a microservice, even these integers should run on a remote server. And to that terrible end, I give you this talk. Everything a microservice, the worst possible introduction to Druby. <laughs> Thank you. Now, because I have the moral compass of a Disney villain, I'm going to walk you through setting up your code to do exactly this, to make every single object run on a remote server. Let's take a look at our terrible, terrible goal. Every object, including ones created by Ruby, automatically running on remote servers. But to get that horrible end, we need to start small. We need some concept of a remote object. I want to somehow create an object, and then when I call a method on that object, have that method run remotely. Now, I could do this myself, maybe have that method issue HTTP requests and then deal with responses and have some server set up to run that object, but that sounds like a lot of work. And one thing you should know about me is that I am as lazy as I am irresponsible. And therefore, <laughs> I'm going to try to use something built into Ruby. I would like to introduce you to Druby. Now, Druby is an interesting little API for creating and using remote objects. It's built into the Ruby standard library. Although, if you want, there is a bonus external gem that goes with it that you can get by installing by doing a gem install derb. And that just adds some features to the built-in version, but we're gonna stick with the built-in version. Now, before I go and show, talk about how, uh, how not to use Druby, let's start out with the correct way to use it. So, Druby has two parts. Uh, it's a, sort of a client service architecture, or client server architecture. You've got some local script, let's just say it's running on my laptop. And then we've got some remote script running on a server in the cloud somewhere. Well, in the remote script, first, require derb derb, because Druby is required by the standard, um, Ruby standard library, but it's not required by default. So you have to require it. Then we set up some class that is going to be a remote object. Next, call derb.startService, and this will do what it says. This will start a Druby service on whatever host name and port you give it. Then we give it some object that's going to handle requests for this service on this port. And here we're just going to give an instance of remote server. Next we call derb.thread.join. This will block this script at this point so that it, it doesn't immediately exit. It will say, stay running and listening for incoming connections. Now on the local side, we again require derb derb. Then we do derb object.new with URI. And this does what it says on the tin. This will create a new object from whatever URI you give it. And what you want to give it is the URI where you started your server. Now, this remote object, this is a proxy object. That means it's not really an instance of remote server. If I call a method.foo, that method will get proxied to the remote server, run on the remote side, and then any, any result will get returned back to the local side. Let's see how these work. 
I can run the remote.rb, and this will stop and wait for incoming connections. Then on the local side, I run local.rb, and this will immediately cause the foo method to get run, but it will cause it to get run on the remote server, not the local one. This is already kind of like a little microservice with very little code. We have a remote object. But all right, that's how you're supposed to use Druby. And it, it kind of sucks. I mean, we have to explicitly set up this foo method on the remote side. Any method you want to call has to be previously set up on the remote side before you can use it on the local side. And that's not what we want. Let's take a look back at our goal. We just want to write arbitrary Ruby code and have every object magically become a remote object. What we want is some sort of function that will, given a class like this, create a remote instance of it via magic. And then what we should get is a nice proxy object. And we don't want to have to pre-configure everything on the remote side. And well, if we want, if we can set up any object to be um, remote through Druby, why don't we just make a remote class that creates new objects? So here I'm calling remote, I'm creating a class called remote newer with a method make new. All it does is it takes in a class, calls new on it, and then returns the resulting object. We set that up as a Druby service, and now on my local side, I can create an instance of this remote newer using derb object.new with URI, and call make new, give it a class, and I should get an instance of this remote newer class, of this um, some class class. And this sort of works, but it doesn't quite do what we want. Um, let's take a look at why. Here's what Druby is doing. If you have a remote object and you call a method on it, that method will run on the remote side, and then anything that method returns has to get back to the local side. So Druby will serialize whatever it's returning, in this case the string bar, send it over the wire and deserialize it on the local side. And if you do that with a string, all you get is a copy of that string, a local string. And that's not what we, what we want. With our make new method, we want to get another proxy object instead. Well, it turns out Druby is very good at serializing simple things like strings and integers. It doesn't know how to serialize everything though. For example, if I have a remote method that returns something weird, something that Druby does not know how to serialize, instead of trying to return this, it will keep this instance of something weird on the remote side and instead return a proxy object, a derb derb, ob derb, derb object. And of course, then if I call a method on that, it will get proxied out to the remote side and back. And that's what we wanted with our make new function. Well, how does Druby know what is too weird to serialize? Well, um, you can tell it. You can say for a given class, include this derb derb undump mixin, and now Druby will never attempt to serialize instances of this class. So all right, back to our rem um, remote newer make new nonsense. Now this make new function takes a class, we create a new instance of it, and we're just gonna cram in this derb derb undump mixin to any object we have created. And so this works. I have some class, I create a new instance of my remote newer, I use that to make a new instance of this class, and now what I get is a derb derb object, a Druby proxy object. But this make new function, it kind of sucks. It only works if the class has, takes no arguments. So let's beef it up. Now it can handle classes that take multiple arguments, um, keyword arguments, blocks, whatever, and it just passes that on to the new uh, function of this class. Easy enough. And this works. I create my remote newer, and now I can call make new. Let's say we're gonna make a new string, and I'll give it some initial value, the string one, two, three. Now, what I get is actually a remote string instead of a local string. And I should be able to be able to call any method that I could normally call on a string on this remote string. I can call 2i, that 2i will get proxied out to the remote server, run, and then the result returned. But how can we prove that to ourselves? Because 2i is just gonna return an integer, for all we know, it ran locally. Well, here's how. Uh, don't worry about this code too much. All I'm doing is monkey patching the living daylights out of Druby so that anytime it, call, it tries to do proxy a method, it will print out what that method is. So back to our remote, remote new nonsense. We created a remote string. We called 2i on it. Well, let's see what happens. On a remote side, make new is a proxied method, and so is 2i. 2i did run on the remote server. This little string here, this is a tiny microservice. And so, we can already make everything we want be microservices. We can create a remote newer, then we can create a remote string, a remote hash, a remote instance of any class we want. But that's already kind of lame for a couple of reasons. And not just that all we've done is add a couple hundred millisecond delay to all of our method calls. <laughs> really, notice how we have to manually call this make new function anytime we want to create a new instance of anything. 
And I don't want to do that. I just want to call string.new or something like that and get a remote object. Well, this is Ruby. The only limits are our imagination and our good sense. <laughs> and since we clearly have exactly one of those things, fuck it, let's just override string.new. Why not? Heck, why stop there? Let's override object.new. And now here I am. Over, we're overriding the new method on the root object class so that instead of returning a normal local object, it will return uh, a remote object. And this should work. String.new should return a remote string. What could go wrong? OK, well, that. It immediately crashes and throws a stack overflow error. Um, it turns out that Druby does need to create some objects under the hood to function. So object.new triggers Druby, triggers object.new, triggers Druby, and so on and so forth. And you get an infinite loop. Um, and you know, the classic way to deal with infinite recursion is to carefully consider your recursive cases, your base cases, your edge cases, and make sure that doesn't happen. But that sounds like a lot of work, so I'm just gonna inspect the call stack, and if I'm about to recurse, don't. <laughs> Why not? So here I am using the caller method in Ruby, which is a cool method. It gives you the entire stack trace at the current point in code as an array of strings. So we're just going to look through that and just muck about in there and say, is anything in here Druby? Was I called from Druby? And if so, then I am at risk of recursing. And so instead of creating a funky weird remote object, we are going to create a regular local object. We do this by, before overriding object.new, we stash the original object.new method that actually creates local objects. Then, if we are at risk of recursing, we unbind it and rebind it to the current object and then call it. To this is all this effort just to create a normal object. But if we are not at risk of recursing, we can do our crazy uh, remote new object. And voila, this works. I can call string.new and I get a remote proxy object for that string. Same with this array. And calling 2i will run on the remote server, calling sum will run on the remote server. Look at this array, it's a thing of beauty. I've always thought that the only thing better than a Ruby array would be a Ruby array where every method call involves a network round trip. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I can create an array and it works fine. I can call any random method I want. Not that one. That one causes an error. It, I call the dot each and it gives me no dump data is defined for class proc. And I swear, there's a reason for this. It's not just that Druby is getting tired of our bullshit and is like, throwing exceptions out of spite. <laughs> really, it's because each takes a block. Now, let's take a look at what Druby's doing under the hood to understand why that's a problem. If you have a remote object in Druby and you call a method on it with an argument, Druby needs to serialize this argument, send it to the remote side, and have the remote side handle it. To do that, it calls marshall.dump, which we'll look at in a minute, uh, with that argument. If you call a method on a remote object that takes a block, well, a block is just a fancy kind of argument. And so Druby will just try to dump that as a proc. Now, what is Marshall? Marshall's Ruby's built-in way of serializing arbitrary objects. You give it some hash like this, a colon one, and call marshall.dump, and it will dump it to some data. Data that you could save to a disk, or send over the wire, or over the network, or whatever. And then later on, you can reload it with marshall.load. And that should give you a copy of the same object you put in. Now, here's the problem. Druby, sorry, Marshall does not know how to serialize procs. Um, and why would it? I mean, actually, sorry. First, Marshall does not know how to serialize procs. The error you get is that same error we were seeing earlier. No dump data is defined for class proc. And really, why would Marshall know how to serialize a proc? Procs can reference any arbitrary Ruby code. They can reference variables outside of themselves, classes outside of themselves, methods, constants, globals, whatever. And so, uh, in order to serialize a proc, you would have to, I don't know, serialize the entire program execution context somehow. So there's just no way to coherently serialize a, uh, serialize a block. So obviously we are going to incoherently serialize one. Because it turns out you can totally tell Marshall how to serialize things it doesn't know how to, how to serialize. You do this by defining a couple methods on whatever the class of whatever instance you're trying to serialize. First, we have to define a dump method. And this method should serialize whatever proc is trying to be serialized. We're going to do this with a method called serialize block. We'll look at how that works in a second, but what it does is it's going to serialize the current proc into a string representing that proc, just as raw source code, basically. <laughs> Some people can already see the, the implications of this. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, if you tell Marshall how to serialize something, you have to tell it how to deserialize something. You do this by defining a load method, which takes in the same thing your dump method put out. 
Now, given a string like this, how would you turn that into a real live in-memory proc? Well, you can just prepend the string proc and eval it. And you're going to eval something like that. <laughs> now, um, that's, how you, that's teaching pro, uh, Marshall how to serialize procs. But you might notice that I'm eliding a lot of dark magic underneath this serialize block function. How does that work? Poorly. But um, this is already a talk about things that should not be. So I'll, I'll take you through it. It's a two-step process. The first is we need to find the source of some block. So we've got this proc here. We need to find the raw source code of this. And we can get part of the way there with a method called, with um, some proc.binding.source location. And what this gives you is two pieces of information. First, the file name where this proc was defined and the line number. Well, if you want, you can just read that file name from disk, skim down to the appropriate line, and pull out that line. Why not? And that's, like, that's doable. It gets a little messy if the proc spans multiple lines, but it is still possible. But it's a lot of code, and I'm, we've established that I'm very lazy. So instead, we're going to use a, a gem called method source, which does exactly what we just saw, but under the hood and for us. So given some proc, I can call some proc.source, and it will give me the source code lines for that proc as a string. But notice how it gave us the entire line, not just the block. We want just the things from the do to the end inclusive. But it also gave us the proc method, the assignment, the variable, all that jazz. So how are we going to pull out just the block? Well, I guess I could run this string through an incredibly complex regular expression, but I think if I tried to parse Ruby code with regular expressions, I would get beaten up in the parking lot by a gang of angry computer science professors for my sins against computer science. So instead, we're going to run it through an actual parser. There are several nice Ruby parsers out there. Um, the one we're going to use is syntax tree. Now, don't worry too much about this code. Uh, it's kind of the font is intentionally too small to be useful. What we're doing under the hood here with syntax tree is we start out with some raw Ruby code. We are going to pass this to syntax tree and say, "Hey, parse this for me," and it will do that. It will turn it into a tree-like data structure, an abstract syntax tree representing the structure of that code. Then we're going to walk that, that abstract syntax tree until we find something that syntax tree, the gem, tells me, or tells us is a block. We'll get here, and syntax tree will say, yes, this is a node of type block. I'll say, great. Let's give me everything below this point in the tree, and then format it, print it out, turn it into a string. And look what we get, the block itself, just what we wanted with none of the cruft. And um, now, uh, of course, if we use this to serialize a block, and this block referenced any variables outside of it, or classes outside of it, or anything that's not in the block itself, it won't work. But when have we ever let common sense like that stop us? So let's press on. Remember, we taught Marshall how to serialize a block using this serialize block function. And it works. I can call marshall.dump with a proc, and it will dump something. It will give us some data. Well, can we reload it? Yes, marshall.load works. We get a reloaded proc. Now, I can even run this proc with three, and it will print four. We did what the impossible. We've serialized a block, and they said it couldn't be done. OK, no one said it couldn't be done. They said it shouldn't be done. But we did it anyway. And it works. We've taught Marshall how to serialize a block, and Druby just uses Marshall. So if I call ray.new, that gets picked up and turned into a proxy object by our previous code. Now I call each, and Druby will serialize this block. And it won't throw an error. This each will get run on the remote server, and the block will get run on the remote server, and that's where 123 will print out. We are now one step closer to the microservice architecture that all our favorite thought leaders tell us we need. But you might have noticed a problem, and I don't just mean the sketchy looking guy up on stage wearing flannel. You might have noticed how we have to explicitly call array.new. I don't usually create arrays like that. I usually would much prefer if I could use the array literal syntax, or the string literal syntax, or the hash literal syntax. But how can we do that? I mean, we could override array.new like some kind of maniac, but we've already overridden object.new. And th this technique works if you explicitly call array.new like we've been doing. But it does, does not work for the array literal syntax. Nothing happens when you do that. And it turns out there's just no good way to override the literal syntax for arrays at least not without getting into Ruby's C code, which is a little more sketch than I'm willing to do in this talk. So instead, what if we could take the array literal syntax and somehow transform it into array.new syntax that does the same thing, more or less? Well, this could work, but then I'd have to run some Ruby code that reads my Ruby code, transforms it, and spits out more Ruby code. And that's, I don't want to do that. I just want to run my code and have it work. 
So to do that, I'm going to introduce you to the ultimate tool in every Ruby villain's toolbox for messing with syntax. Data. Sorry, um, that's probably confusing. <laughs> data. Data, yes. The, uh, the Ruby keyword that pairs with another keyword called underscore, underscore, end, underscore, underscore. And here's how it works. You've got some arbitrary Ruby code, and then you've got an end. And Ruby will read and execute down to this end, then ignore everything after. So you can have things that are not valid Ruby code thereafter. It's meant for data. Now you're supposed to put data there, but you can also just put, oh, sorry, I skipped over an important bit. Um, if you call data.read in your code, you actually get the contents that came after the end as a string. Now you're supposed to put data there, but you don't have to, you can just put more Ruby code. It won't get evaluated unless you eval it. <laughs> now, at the moment, this is just an incredibly convoluted way to run a few lines of Ruby code. But the cool thing is it lets, gives you an opportunity to run a preprocessor on your code. For example, I can take this code after the end, run it through a regular expression that finds and replaces anything that looks like an array and converts it to the array.new syntax. And heck, I can do the same thing for hashes and strings too, why not? And this will convert each of these into explicit dot new syntax, which will get picked up by object.new and turned into one of those Druby proxy objects for us. Now, I did say that if I were to parse Ruby code using regular expressions as we're doing here, I would get beaten up in the parking lot by a gang of angry computer science professors. But the talk is almost over and I think I can make it to the airport before they find me. The rest of you are on your own. So quickly, one last step. Right now, each of these objects will become remote proxy objects. But are they really microservices? I mean, they're all remote, but they're all remote to the same place. Our network diagram kind of looks like this, which is pretty lame. I mean, if we want our blog post about this cutting edge architecture to make it to the top of Hacker News, which is obviously the only reason to mess with microservices, it needs to look something more like this. Because as any distributed systems engineer will tell you, the more network hops you have in your system, the faster and more reliable it will be. So let's rig this up so that our remote code, each remote object, runs on a different remote server. Now, we're already on track to have a really trendy hipster architecture, but going even further in that direction, let's make it serverless. Let's run each of our objects in an AWS Lambda function. <laughs> now, um, those of you who are familiar, those of you who are familiar with AWS Lambda might know that Lambdas are limited to 15 minutes of runtime at most which thankfully I don't think we'll have anywhere near that amount of uptime for this architecture, so we don't have to worry about it. Our program will crash well before that. <laughs> now, um, so let's press on. If you're not familiar with AWS Lambda, it's a cool service um, by Amazon Web Services. You give them a function definition and they will run it for you whenever you ask. One time, a thousand times, a thousand times at once, and you don't have to worry about where it runs. You don't have to worry about EC2 boxes or Heroku dynos or any of that stuff. And of course, for the privilege, they will charge you a fraction of a cent per second that your Lambda is running. Cool. Anyway, the basic Lambda function definition looks like this. So let's just cram our Druby setup into that. So I start a Druby service, and then I call derb.thread.join. So this Lambda handle, handler, which is supposed to run for only a few seconds, will block and never complete and just listen for incoming connections forever. Um, and AWS will charge me for the full 15 minutes before it times out. Now. A brief aside to those of you who really know your lambdas, this isn't quite possible. Lambdas, uh, they don't allow you to accept incoming connections. But it is possible with the magic of tail scale. Unfortunately, I do not have time to go into how that works, but tail scale is really cool. Because really, but really that's, that's DevOps nonsense, and we're not here for that. We're here for Ruby nonsense. So back to that. So we're trying to create a remote proxy object in a lambda. First, we need to start one of those lambdas. I'm going to do that on a, a random host name. Then we need to sleep three seconds because we need the Lambda to like, have, time, have time to get started and Druby to start listening on the, on the port. Then we construct the URI that we want to connect to, to connect to that Lambda. Then we can create one of our remote newers inside of this Lambda. Then we can call remote newer.make new and create a new, pro new proxy object to an object living in this AWS Lambda. Then we have to do a little bit of hackery because sometimes Druby gets confused about what URI it's supposed to be talking to. Then we return this proxy object we just created. And now we have what we wanted. Every single object remote into a different machine for each object running in AWS Lambda. You can tell this will be blindingly fast because I had to add that three second sleep in there just to make it run. <laughs> so let's see how this whole system works. <laughs> 
This is the unspeakable atrocity that I promised you. And this is what we've done. We pre-processed, uh, in, in what is surely a cardinal sin of software, we converted all of our array, hash, and string literals into explicit .new calls using regular expressions. Then, in a further show of utter depravity, we overrode the object.new method. And then, to add insult to injury, we prevented infinite recursion just by mucking around with the call stack. <laughs> Next, in one of our only reasonably normal moves, we used Druby to create remote proxy objects. Then, because we are incapable of doing anything simply, we read our own source code from disk, parsed it into an AST, transformed it, spit it back out into a string, and sent it over the wire, all just so that our remote objects could handle block arguments. Finally, in order to be maximally hipster, we shoved the remote half of this code into serverless AWS Lambda functions. Put it all together, and we've got microservices. Let's see how it works. And it does. This is remote object now. And so is this, and so is this, and so is this. They're all microservices. Ha! Let's see how it works in real life. I've got some sample of arbitrary Ruby code. Surely, our microservice architecture will make this blisteringly fast. OK, so it takes 10 seconds to run, not so much. But surely, it's very cost effective to run. Here's my Lambda bill after about a month or so of messing around with this. Um, OK, so it costs more than it has any right to. But surely, the elegance and simplicity of this setup would be worth it. This is all the code we've gone over in this talk. All right, so it's not so simple. Relative to normal code, it's slower, more expensive, and hideously complex. Well, folks, I say we've succeeded, because that is the textbook definition of a microservice architecture. Congratulations. We should all feel terrible about ourselves. <laughs> How about we stick to building monoliths and agree that the real microservices were the friends we made along the way? <laughs> now, I'd like to take a few minutes for questions and answers, but because I like the sound of my own voice entirely too much, I will be providing both. <laughs> now, the first question I always get when I present on this sort of nonsense is, should I use this in production? And ho <laughs> thank you. hopefully by this point in the talk, the answer is clear. Absolutely. Please do, and tell me how it goes. That will be an amazing story. If you have an excess of stability, performance, and maintainability, this architecture will solve that problem for you. <laughs> now, on a more, more serious note, you may be wondering, what are some reasonable, non-ridiculous use cases for Druby? I'd say Druby is pretty great whenever you, for internal projects, hack projects, small projects, anytime you want to very quickly get up a connection between two chunks of Ruby code running on different processes or even different machines. That said, Druby has no built-in security or authentication. So if you expose a Druby port to the public internet, you are asking for a remote code execution vulnerability. So please, at the very least, wrap it in a VPN or something. Anyway, um, because some people just can't help but rubberneck the car crash, I'm sure some of you are wondering where you can see this code in more detail. And you can find it, this particular code on my GitHub. It's the same code, just with more detail, with a lot more comments and hopefully a little bit easier to read and with a lot of the infrastructure gaps filled in. Now, at this point, I'm sure many of you are wondering, who in God's name are you, how did you get on stage, and how can we beef up RubyConf security so it doesn't happen again next year? Well, my name is Kevin Kukta. You can find me at various places online. Um, my Twitter handle is there, my personal website is there, and I've recently been spending more time on Mastodon, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Now, if you're tired of hearing me talk to myself and have a real question, feel free to hit me up after the talk. I'm always happy to chat or Catch me anywhere around the conference. And finally, I'm sure at least a couple of you are wondering, who in God's name would hire you, and how can I avoid ever working for them? And I would like to assure you in no uncertain terms that I get this sort of nonsense out of my system in my spare time so that when I go to log on to work, I write nice, reliable, boring code that, as far as I'm aware, none of my coworkers want to strangle me over. That said, I work for a company called Daybreak Health. We are a fully remote mental health company, and we provide therapy to teenagers. It is easily the most rewarding job I've ever worked at. We have literally saved people's lives in the time that I've been there. And I don't believe we have an open rec at this exact moment that will certainly change. So next time you're looking for a job, feel free to reach out. I would be happy to chat about it. Feel free to check us out. I think we're pretty cool. And that's the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>